How are you guys feeling? Feeling good. very well stretched. Yes. I love that. Well, um, I thought we'd get together. I like to have these um, gatherings once in a while so that, you know, I make myself available for any questions that you guys have. Um, we usually practice together and then I am happy to break down the sequence and explain kind of what I do behind the scenes for this class. Sometimes when you take it apart and explain why and how we do it is helpful as you know as you are stepping on the path of a yoga teacher so if you have any questions we can start with that and if not we can um, jump into the class sequence and the intention it's up to you okay so I'll go ahead and start then I'll type up this sequence and I'll send it to you via email but um, this was a straight up force yoga class with a little bit of a my own albina flair to it. So the meditation part is um, was my personal addition to that. Um, so in a force yoga tradition, uh, we always set an intent. An intent is something that I, I truly believe it's a mis magic. The mysticism is the power of yoga. Um, the intent is that special ingredient that transforms yoga from it being purely a workout to something so much more, so much more powerful, mystical, magical than just a workout. An intent, if you want to write it down, is something that you can do in every single post throughout the class. In other words, it is physical. And it is something that you can take off of your uh, mat into your everyday life. So it's both something beyond the physical, but the physical connects, connects you to something, you know, something that is more than just the workout. Am I making sense? So the intent, especially when you're starting, can be something simple like breathe into your heart would be a very simple yet a very powerful uh, intent. It can be something like ground down through your feet. In today's class, the intent is ground down through your feet in every single pose. And then, you know, as you're taking them through the class, you can you can say ground down through your feet, press down through your feet, feel your connection to your feet. So you keep saying that and somewhere you can sprinkle in something like when you ground down through your feet, you get to connect to the strength of power of your own legs to, into your own strength, into your own confidence. So that strength can take you through your life. Or when you ground down through your feet, you get to access the Mother Earth energy that is always available to you. Am I making sense? So it's both physical and uh, beyond just the physical. Today's intent was a little bit more complex because it was a, a more advanced class as far as the teaching goes. So my intent was for you to connect to the to the pineal gland, right? And I, I started by saying this is where pineal gland is. So your intention is to connect, breathe, feel that part of your body. And throughout the class, I hope it worked. That was at least my intention. That's what I wanted to do. In every pose, I did my best to say, feel that spot. Feel for moving the energy from the bottom of the pelvis to your pineal gland. Ultimately, it's kundalini rising, the energy waking up in your body. And then throughout the class, I'm saying your pineal gland is your antenna to the mystical. It's your receiver of the mystical. It's your antenna to the divine. It's your connection to God. When you attune and wake up your pineal gland, it absolutely has the potential to connect to the source, something bigger than you, right? So something like that. So that was the intent for today's class. Is that clear? Am, am, am I making sense? Now, the, the, the physical part of the class, um, in forest yoga, we call it a theme. A theme and intent are two different but interrelated part. The theme for today's class was heart openers. So the theme has to do 
with the physical portion of the class, the asana portion. But the intent and theme often go hand in hand together. So I chose the poses intentionally to open up the heart and the neck, right? The pineal gland territory, the, the back of the throat, the base of the skull. So we started with seated side bend with one leg straight. And once again, I'm gonna type it up and send this information to you. So the first part was chest opener. My intention was to open the heart, breathe into the heart and then relax the neck. So from the very first, po oh, sorry, I skipped the breathing. I forgot about the breathing. Uh, so in the first short, the tradition, we start the breathing with the breathing. Pranayama is always a part of the four short sequencing. Um, today was a, a little bit more advanced uh, technique is when we intentionally move the energy from survival to creation, from matter to energy, from the first chakra to the sixth chakra. Um, so that's the first physical pose was so right away, everything that we do in the class is always connected to the intent. What is it that you want to accomplish? There isn't one single pose that is in the sequence by accident. Everything is intentional, is deliberate. Seated side bend, one leg straight with chest opener, right away opens the heart. The moment you open the heart, the energy will automatically move up, up. So relax the neck, connect, move the energy into your pineal gland. Arm behind the back, similar, right? Relaxing the neck even more. Forward fold um, after that is opening up the low back, the mid back, upper back. After that, we did straddle, straddle or frog lifting through. So in the forest yoga tradition, we do core exercises in the beginning of the class. The idea behind that is when your core is warmed up, your whole body is warmed up. So I picked this particular abdominal exercise because um, I wanted to open up the pelvis, wake up the root chakra so the energy can float up into the pineal gland. I'll tell you that initially my class plan was to do elbow to knee, but when I practiced the sequence this morning, I realized that straddle or frog lifting through would be a better uh, core exercise for the intention of this class. So I changed it up. And by the way, um, in a force yoga tradition, and I encourage you, just any yoga teacher, I encourage you to practice your class before you teach it. If you want to be a really masterful teacher, always practice before you teach it um, as close to the class start as possible because you will remember it in your body. Your cueing will be way more effective because you're already connected in feeling with every pose in this class. So anyway, I changed it to straddle lifting through. I like that better in my body. After that, we went to dolphin prep, to dolphin, to dolphin strut. Dolphin prep is when your hands are clasped and you're lifting them up over your head. You, did you guys feel your shoulders, upper back, heart opening? Again, same intent. We're just moving to the back of the heart because once you open the heart, the center of the magnet, the energy will automatically shoot up the spine. So that was my intention. Usually, at least in the forest yoga sequencing, there is always going to be some sort of a dolphin. Um, there are lots of variations of dolphin in the forest yoga sequence, like we do lots of dolphins. Anyway, I just picked dolphin, uh, dol dolphin to dolphin strut to make it a little bit more exciting. And again, I'm cueing the whole time, relax your neck, relax your neck, let the energy cascade down your spine into the base of your skull. In every pose, I am cueing my intent. Give me a nod if you're with me. So then we do B series with three pose vignettes. So the structure goes like this. Um, at least in this style of yoga, um, there, there are many variations that you can, if you're in our 300 hour teacher training, there is a course called the art of sequencing where I break it down at nauseum, different um, methodology behind creating your sequence, right? In the 200 hour teacher training, we only focus on the blueprint with a few variations of power vinyasa flow. In the 300-hour teacher training, there is a class called the art of sequencing, 
where I tell you in great details why we do this, how we do it, etc. So this particular class, I picked the B series with three pose vignettes. We did three pose, we did three vignettes. The first vignette was Eagle Warrior One, Eagle Ostrich to Pigeon. Up level was pigeon heel to butt. That was the first vignette. I picked Eagle Warrior one because I wanted to open up the back of the heart, the back of the neck, and the back of the brain right away because to me it went with intent really well. After that, I did ostrich, eagle ostrich, folding forward. The energy cascades down the spine. Once again, everything is moving to the brain. That was my intent. Pigeon, I chose that to open up the hips again with one intent only so that the energy can move from the pelvis to the crown of the head. Yes, give me a nod. Overall, I just want you to understand that every single pose in this class was there for a reason. And I want you to start thinking about or practicing as you're creating your own sequences, why am I choosing this pose? Every, if you're a really masterful teacher, every pose is there for a reason. And it always ties in with your bigger intent for the class. The second vignette was Archer Warrior Two. Arches when the arms are like this. Again, opening the heart, opening up the shoulders, relax the throat, let the energy move up to the base of your skull. Extended Warrior Variation similar right you can kind of see the trend here relaxing the neck opening the heart let the energy move enjoy breathe and the last pose in this vignette was twisting pigeon armpit to the foot it's my favorite pose because it accomplishes a lot of things in one pose it's a hip opener it's a twist it's a neck release so usually when i teach yoga this pose I, a lot of times in my sequencing this pose is there because it's accomplishes a lot of things in just one pose. And please stop me if you have any questions along the way. The third vignette was warrior one with brain cradle. So it's this one. Again, I'm asking you to breathe into the top and the back of the brain, relax your brain into your own hands. Did you guys feel how the energy started moving up? Give me a nod if you feel a little bit. Um, like I practiced this class twice this morning, once when I was getting ready and the second time with you, I felt it on the second round, time around. I even think I talked about it. I was like, oh, when you do this pose, you get to feel all this tingling all over. I know it worked because I felt it in my body. So worry one with brain cradle. After that, we went into twisting lunge interlock. Now it's a more advanced pose, but I also demoed a couple of down levels right? Remember I said one hand can be down, the other hand is up. You can put your elbow on the thigh or you can go for the bind. Um, it's a deep twist. I wanted to contract the spine even more and twist it so that the once we untwist, when you go into compression, everything compresses. And when you untwist, the energy just floats up the spine. That was my reasoning for that pose. And then lounge lunge after that, after a deep twist, um, lounge lunge feels really good for the side body. So I just wanted, you know, for pe to people for people to pause and enjoy that flow of energy. After that deep twist, the energy flows. It just flows along the spine. The apex or the most important or the, the highest portion of the class was wheel pose. I also cued people through bridge. If you're not, if you don't want to do wheel, do bridge. After that, we did spinal twist. And then I finished the physical portion of the class with half lotus shin bound spinal twist. Um, I like this pose, and I think I even mentioned it in the class that half lotus shin bound spinal twist is a great wind down after a back bend because it's a twist, it's a little bit of a forward fold, and it's a neck release. Uh, Jordan, do you have a question? Yes, hi, Ben. Uh, so I noticed the vignette just mm, like flowed together. Um, yeah. Like maybe I would, I would say like we didn't like close the sun B between the vignettes. Um, like, you know, back to the top of the mat, 
stand up. It, is is that a time thing? Is that a choice? Is yeah. that the correct? Yeah. So what what um what Jordan is asking is between each vignette, do you bring them to the top of the mat to standing, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So um now force yoga, the creator of force yoga Anna Force is constantly evolving and changing the methodology. It is constantly getting better. In the olden days of forest yoga, we did not come to the top of the mat. We just did the first vignette, you do vinyasa down dog. Then you step, step one foot forward and you start the second vignette, etc. In the later years, in the recent years, she started bringing people to the top of the mat between each vignette. It's something that she started probably in the last two years. I think you can do it either way. I I skip that part because uh, I only have one hour to to you know do a lot of stuff with you. So I usually do not bring them to the top of the mat. I leave them in down dog between the vignettes. Does that answer your question, Jordan? Yes, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it's not right or wrong, correct or incorrect. It's just she evolved, and this is a change that she implemented literally in the last couple of years. I think Jose wanted it that way. I, I run out of time sometimes and I have to blow off a vignette, which is kind of a bummer after I put all this time into planning the vignettes appropriately. And I think it's because I'm constantly bringing people all the way up. It does take a lot of time. So I would say ditch it. If you're teaching one hour yeah. classes, then ditch it. Now, remember when okay. Anna Forest teaches uh, workshops, it's four hours long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You only mm -hmm. have one hour. So I would say be smart about the selection of your poses. And I would say ditch that bringing them to the top of the mat part. Super. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any questions about the sequencing? Um, why I picked this poses or the intention, intense setting? I will type it up for you and um, I'll send it to you via email. I think there is a large connection uh, collection of these gatherings that we have saved somewhere on the internet. It's definitely on my YouTube channel. But if you wanted to, I'll send you the recording of this class, the recording of this workshop after the class in the class sequence. You're welcome to borrow it, make it your own, go over it a couple of times. That's how I learned the sequencing, just repeating over and over and over again until I understood it and I started embodying it in my body. I would say on general, this type of sequences learn, takes 10 years to master, 10 years. So uh, there was a lot of twists mm -hmm. in the sequence. Yeah. So you do twists, uh, you're asking why we're doing why? the twists? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're doing the back bending class, the twists are necessary to warm up the spine. Okay. So there are certain um, basics, uh, principles of, you know, back bending class, hip opening class in your manual. We have one manual for the 200 and 300 hour teacher training. In the manual, there is a section of what you need to do for a back bending class. Usually we recommend, you know, sun salutations, we do abdominals and a lot of twists. In a back bending class, you must do lots and lots of twists to lubricate the spine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good question. I have a question, Albina. Yeah. Um, about what is forest yoga? It's about, uh, it's a woman or... Yeah, forest uh, yoga. Um, forest yoga. The creatrix of forest yoga is Anna Forest. In your um, suggested book reading, there is a book uh, by Anna Forest called Fierce Medicine. I recommend that you read it. It's a really powerful book. Anna Forest is my teacher. I am a forest yoga guardian. There are very few people around the world who Anna Forest picks to be like, we carry the legacy forward, so to speak. So it's kind of rare to 
like to find a four sugar guardian. Uh, four sugar guardians can teach four sugar teacher trainings ultimately. Um, but it's the class that we did today is a forest yoga class. In our 300 hour teacher training, there's an entire module dedicated to that. And the art of sequencing is largely rooted in the forest yoga methodology. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anna Forest is her name. She is now teaching um, that with her husband, Jose Calarco. That's why I mentioned, you know, his name. But the creator of Forest Yoga is Anna, Anna Forest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Now, you can make this class and make it into a power flow. You can take the sequence and make it a powerful sequence. You just have to move a lot faster. And you'd probably have to, before we go into the vignettes, I would recommend doing three sun A's and three sun B's. Um, if you do that and you move through the sequence a lot faster than we did, you could turn it into a power flow class. <laughs> I don't like moving that fast. I prefer slow and intentional. Uh, also, I wanted you to get into the altered state of consciousness for the meditation. I hope it worked. So to me, when you move real slowly, you get really yoga stoned, really like, oh, what? Like I wanted you to be in that state. Uh, so meditation, any question? How did, did you like the meditation? Did you get your answers a little bit? Like all I need to remember, all I need to do. Now remember, meditation is just like asana practice. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, so ultimately, um, I picked this chakra meditation. It's a variation of chakra meditation for life decision making that every single one of you have access to. It's both in the 200 hour and 300 hour module. I think it's also on my YouTube channel, on my uh, Instagram. Um, it's a powerful meditation. Um, the longer version of it is you ask every chakra for guidance and you will get that guidance every single time. And again, it's just a, um, a skill that you get to develop, that you get to master. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, just as a variation of the chakra meditation. You guys I mean, I have a question. Yeah, go on ahead, Jordan. One. Thank you. I think um, I generally understand that we talk about seven main chakras mm -hmm. and with the introduction, it feels like of the pineal gland, I feel like you refer to that as the seventh chakra. And it's then the like the eighth pineal eighth. gland is the sixth chakra. Oh, okay. So, thank you. Okay. So it, it feels like we're talking about eight instead of seven. Um, and I just was wondering if there's a philosophy that comes from or I understand that there's te yeah. technically more but I feel like we we generally talk about seven so I was just kind of curious about that for a while now yeah so there's seven chakras in the body the eighth chakra is technically above the crown of your head the eighth chakra is your portal it's your portal to the divine it's about a foot and a half up away from the crown of your head that's eighth chakra and the reason why you don't hear about it that often as often as you hear seven is because it's outside of your body physical body eighth okay. chakra is so the portal to the divine eighth chakra is how the energy comes into your body from the divine from the source um okay it, it's a and bar it, and then Seventh is between the eyebrows, sixth is pineal and throat, like kind of all in that area or? Yeah. So, um, you know, you'll hear it slightly differently. In traditional mm -hmm. yogic philosophy, you'll hear the seventh chakra as being the crown of your head and the sixth chakra being behind your eyes, right? It's your third eye. Um now, I follow my teacher, Joe Dispenza, my meditation teacher, and he's done a lot okay. of science-based, um, you know, research. And he calls the pineal gland the sixth chakra. And the pineal gland, it's not precise, but it is between the back of the throat and the back of the brain, kind of centered, kind of back of the brain. 
So, uh -huh. but it's different than the throat chakra. The third ch throat chakra is your fifth chakra. It's it's the throat. Sixth chakra is more in the brain. It's more up more in the brain, but it's towards the back of the throat, the back of the brain and the back of the throat. Look it up. Look it up okay, on the okay. on Google. That's really, I, that's really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I thought it was coming from Joe Dispenza. So I'm it about is. to dive into all that. So thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. All right, friends. Any other questions? Any questions about I know that we had like a ton of people, several hundred people joined the 200 and the 300 hour teacher training back in November and December. Uh, do we have, I, th I think we have a couple of people who joined brand new. Do you guys have any questions about the course, about the homework, anything? I actually have a question. It's yeah. it's more technical nature. I've been doing some of your classes, you know, on YouTube YouTube video, and enjoyed them a lot. Yeah. Um, there is um, when you do um, um, a chaturanga, you don't go down on your like in a. You, you always use your your legs, your knees. Um, is uh -huh. there some? Is there like, I've never seen that. Yeah. <laughs> is there something? that's uh, um, particular to you, the way you do yoga or? Yeah. Um, this, okay. Yeah. What is your name? I'm Ursula. Oh, Ursula. Ursula. Oh, I can't see because the sun is behind you, Ursula. I know, hey. I know, I know. In the fall, and it says this uh, here, this iPhone. Is better. <laughs> oh, yeah, way better. Hi, so good to Sorry. see you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I thought I recognized the accent, but because I didn't yes. see the face, I didn't uh, know. Well, good. Yes, that's a really great question, Ursula. The vast majority of people have no business doing chaturangas with their knees off the floor. They just don't have strength that it takes to do chaturangas with their knees off the floor. That is why the most common injury that you see in yoga is what? Rotator sure. cuff injury. Rotator cuff. Because most people have no business doing it. Um, the, the shoulder joint is the most unstable joint in the body. And most of us just don't have enough strength to do chaturanga properly. Most people will dump into the shoulder um, and you'll see it in power vinyasa flow classes. People just go like this. When they're doing chaturanga, their shoulders go like this. That means the collapsed shoulder. You're going to, it's not good for the shoulder. So um, if you go into mat to mat, which is required for the 200 hour teacher training. We have the entire module on hands-on assist and also all the alignment breakdown for par vinyasa flow, but we go at nauseum about chaturanga. The heads of the shoulders need to be away from the floor, away from the ears and elbows go straight back. A lot of times you see people squeeze the elbows in. No, no, no. They need to go straight back, not squeeze in. So anyway, it's a really complex move. Most people do it incorrectly. I cannot do it correctly with my knees off the mat. Therefore, to take care of my body, I do my chaturangas with knees down. Plus, mm -hmm. I ain't no spring chicken anymore. I cannot afford to have an injury. When I was dumb and young in my 20s, I did lots of chaturangas with my knees off the mat. It was not smart but I'm not going to do that anymore. Hence, I haven't had an injury in knock on wood in a very, very long time. When I was in my 20s, I had an injury almost every week because I just didn't have the body intelligence or awareness to do it the way that felt good and was safe for my body. Does that help, Ursula? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, I was just uh, surprised because in, in you know, any videos or any classes I've taken, I've never seen that type of chaturanga and you yeah. do it every time so i think it, it totally makes sense yeah it's not that it's incorrect it's just right. my preference is to do my with my knees down because i i don't think i have i don't have enough 
strength that it takes to do it correctly with my knees off the mat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Any other questions? Look at us yoga nerds on a Sunday nerding out on yoga. I love that. I love that. Okay, so if you have no other questions, um, you know, I'm leading a retreat, a silent retreat. It's outside of Houston, between Houston and Austin. It's a silent meditation retreat in September. Um, if you want to come, you're welcome to. It's filling up already. Um, anytime you do a retreat with us, those hours count towards your 300-hour teacher training. So like if you do a meditation retreat, it counts as a mandatory hours, which is kind of nice, I think. So I just wanted to put it on your radar. If you want to join us, we'd love to have you. It's on my website. And then um, do you like these gatherings? We used to do them every month and I kind of fell off the wagon. I will schedule another one and probably in the next four to six weeks. Um, and there is a lot of prior gatherings, recordings on the website, you know, the modules, and also on my YouTube channel. They're open to the public. So you can find a lot of great information there. All right, my friends, thank you so much for joining. Thank Have you. That was very helpful. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye. Bye.